Uh, good evening. This is Chitrata Chatterjee from uh, SIA India, and uh, uh, welcome you all today for this wonderful journey we are about to take into high space. Uh, I will not take up too much of your time just now. I will request our president, Dr. Subharao Pauluri. Uh, he is a technologist and an entrepreneur with extensive experience in Indian space uh, program. ISRO for over four decades. He is the chairman managing director of Anand Technologies uh, Limited, uh, which is the first private industry to set assembly, integration, and testing facilities for satellite and launch vehicles in India. Dr. Rao, would you like to uh, say a few words as uh, an opening? Yeah, sure. The, um, the greetings to all of you. And uh, the distinguished panelists and friends, it's indeed a great uh, the privilege for me to address all of you, so distinguished part of that. Of course, I was also part of Indian Space Program some time ago. Uh, I worked within the space program, then I left and started my journey as an individual, as an entrepreneur, and uh, I contributed to 88 satellites so far and 68 launch vehicles in one way or the other in India. So that's the kind of journey I had in the space program all along. Today, after the reforms have been announced, a lot of new things are happening in this area in India. And of course, a lot of entrepreneurs like me also will be, you know, the coming up and a lot of contribution going to happen in this the space activity in India. And in, in this, you know, we have Mrs. Laita Thambika, who is, you know, very distinguished and she had entire career, you know, in, in space. And uh, perhaps the first woman to get into, into like, you know, kind of program like a the human space flight program. Perhaps nowhere in the world that woman is managing a, such a program. In fact, thanks to Indian space program, to Lalitambaji, now this is a reality. And we are talking about something like women in space. In fact, the space itself is women. If you go by the, the Indian mythology, Prakruti, Prakruti is the nature. Nature engulfs the entire Viswam. Viswam is the space. So the woman in woman itself is the space. Sri Tattva, what you call that? That is what is known as Prakriti. Prakriti is, is the space. So that is the kind of thing, the greatness. And uh, I, in fact, I don't want to say woman in space. In space itself, is woman. That's the reason why you know I don't want to use the words woman in space. And as you know, this Prakriti has created. Three versions of the Indian philosophy again. The creators, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, all that were created by that. It was done by the great woman, Sri Tattva, called Lalita Ambika. That is the greatness. So, therefore, I would like to say that, you know, women themselves all the space. And of course, men like us, we stole in between something in between. And I'm sure that you, you're going to come back into this with more vigorously. And uh, in fact, this is the derivative of a program that has been you know, announced by the, uh, you know, by the, the United Nations earlier. It's called the World Space Week, conducted by United Nations in an annual event that, you know, participation of uh, about 96 countries have participated in that. And they wanted to have a, a special programs to be conducted, the women in space. So therefore, SIA, the, our, our organization, has took the initiative of conducting a seminar of this kind and put all the distinguished you know, panelists for this activity. And in fact, today it gives me great pressure to have you all as in the panel, the most distinguished panelists, the tech women in space. In fact, this paves the way for the next generation. So I'm so proud to announce SA India brings to you a panel of eminent speakers to talk about their journey in space ecosystem. And you must have heard about the, you know, normally we'll say the sky is the limit. In fact, today the sky is not the limit. That's misnomer. Because, you know, beyond sky, we have many things, you know, planets, we have stars, we have many other things into that. So therefore, sky is never the limit. And particular for women, the sky is never a limit. The women, their vision, their ambition, and their willingness to work hard. That is the only thing, the limitation. Yad bhavam. Tadbhavati. 
That's what we say in our language, which means that, you know, you, yourself, you keep the limitations. Sky is never the limit for women. And as you know, no, we watch TV news, we read newspapers, and we listen to the, we listen to the many speakers. And everywhere, we hear that India's potential to the world, to be a world leader, to be a part of the fight trade economy. That's what, you know, the present, the, the, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and you know, the, the, the government's ambition. And in order to reach this, I'm sure the generation where the capacity and the capability to rise and even to bar much higher than the fight trillion economy. And in that space is going to play a very dominant role in terms of not only building up the satellites and launch vehicles, but a lot of applications on the ground segment, terrestrial part of it, a lot, lot of applications coming up in that. So therefore, we have the chance today to achieve that many of us which we dream, we have been dreaming earlier. And go out there and make a place for yourself. In fact, I don't have to, you, you, you know, with boda, so you know, something like, you know, to the women to say that. But women are going out, they will achieve the goals as industry leaders. I'm sure all of you are going to make name for yourself and make the country proud. The panelists today in our discussions are perfect examples of excellence. Each one of them, the perfect example of excellence, hard work and ambition. The ladies present here have reached the peak of their careers and are leading in the front line today in the country. Therefore, just to have a few words to say about, you know, few of our distinguished panelists. And we have a moderator today is Mrs. Arati Polamani, and she's the Secretary General at the ESOA, you know, since 2004, the Indian women occupying the position. That is the proud moment to all of us. Very good, Amma. You've done extremely well. And she's also a member of the World Economic Forum. And the group, this, you know, that's the kind of a, who sets the global agenda for economics. And she's a part of that. She's an active member. Under all of this leadership, ESOA and its members, member CEOs, a lot of other member CEOs in that, have led the effort to, to showcase the entire benefits of satellite communication for a more inclusive, and secure society. That is the important part of it. And hats out to you, Omar. And we have here Dr. Vyal Lalitambika. Of course, she started as electrical engineer in her studies. And she joined Vikram Sarabhai Space Center in 1988. And she has, you know, the number of eclons she got into. And she has been comforted with the INAE Women Engineer Award in 2020. And ISRO Performance Excellence Award in 2013. And ISRO Merit Award in 2010. Astronautical Society of India Space Gold Medal. And she has been recognized as the Queen of Skies at Aero India 2019. Great. Okay. And not only that, it doesn't stop there. She's gone much beyond that. Mary Curie Mahila Vignana Poraskar. She got his as early as 2018. In fact, long list of awards. In fact, she's something like, you know, Viswakarma Shristi with all that, you know, Viswaropa as a woman. Thanks. Thank you, Oma, for being the part of the panel today. Then we have Dr. Sumita Mahanti. You know, the interesting part here is she's a spaceship designer. So we have come across the people, you know, we've been designing the launch vehicles, satellites, and a lot of other things. But she's a spaceship designer. And the only space entrepreneur to have started enterprise in three different continents across the globe. That's what's called Total Visform. In 2019, Susmita was selected as one of the, you know, the BBC's 100 women laureates, okay? Inspiring and influencing a female lead culture. Thank you, Amma. And in 2017, she featured on the cover of Fortune magazine. That's the proud moment. I'm sure your parents must have really appreciated all your friends and across the country. Pretty well proud of you, Oma. As an avid traveler, she's probably the only woman to have visited Arctic and Antarctic. You can imagine the kind of a diary and diary she has, the full in her heart. And she hopes to take a trip to the moon soon with the same spirit. Good. Wish you all good luck, Oma. God bless you. Then we have another woman who comes from the Air Force, Nilu Khatri. 
In fact, she is the first wing commander in Indian Air Force. That is first, you know, lady officer in that. And she was also the, the first one to rise to the position of wing commander within Air Force. And after a successful stint as within IAF, nearly joined KPMG. That means she also did the management. And this is not only patriotism of Desha Bhakti, but also looking at economics of the country, you know, KPMG. And uh, where her role is to create a new line of business for consulting and, and the requirements, aerospace and defense and homeland security for various clients in the country. She is a founding partner of Blue Orange Synergies, a consulting company again for solutions for aerospace, defense and energy industries. Currently, she's a senior vice president of government affairs at Akash Air. Welcome, Emma. Thank you. Then we have Ms. Jena Tevana. Her background is, you know, comes from the aerospace engineering with a second master's degree from the International Space Agency, Space University. She said to move to Luxembourg soon to join Space Incorporation as European business development partner. Look, the kind of across the globe business promotion. And uh, Jena's aim is to bridge the gap between technical and business issues in the space industry. Um, I think we need you more now in India too. And with such an illustrious panel in line, I have the pleasure and honor of you know, inviting the, uh, Ms. Arati Pola to moderate the session. And where the panelists will talk about their experiences and uh, they will, I'm sure that you know they inculcate the spirit to the youngsters in this country. I, and I was told that about 400, 500 people have registered for this seminar. And I'm sure you are going to inspire each one of them. And I request before that, you know, Ms. Chitrika Chatterjee, our Senior Director of Operations, SIA, to introduce the panel formally. Thank you, Amma. Over Chitra. So, thank you for that wonderful opening remarks. And uh, I'm sure the audience is already excited to listen to the uh, panelists. Uh, before I uh, introduce the panelists, uh, Dr. Rao has already introduced them, but I'll just speak a little bit about them. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules uh, for the attendees. Uh, for a better viewing experience, please uh, click on the gear and uh, set, set the, uh, select 720p. That gives you a better experience. Uh, on YouTube, and we are live on YouTube and Facebook also. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can go to comment there. And please keep your questions short and precise. Please follow, like us, subscribe to us on our social media handles. And for any tweets, keep those tweets coming, please. And please use hashtag SIA India Tech Woman in Space. So I'd now like to introduce the speakers. Uh, I would like to call in uh, uh, Arti Hola Mani the Secretary General of uh, ESOA since 2004. Uh, since joining the association, she has led the expansion of ESOA from a European association to one that represents the interests of 22 global and regional satellite operators. Uh, Arthi is already here. Uh, uh, Dr. Lalit Ambika. Uh, Dr. Rao has already mentioned her credentials. Uh, I will just uh, give her a little bit about her. Currently, she is designated as distinguished scientist and director, director of directorate of human space program at ISRO. In her earlier position as deputy director Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, she was responsible for uh, guidance and control design, mission analysis and uh, simulation activities of all ISRO launch vehicles. She has played a major role in their success. Dr. Sushmita Mohanty, uh, she is an Indian spaceship designer and a climate action advocate. She is well known for her research on space related topics. Uh, she co-founded India's first private space startup, Earth to Orbit in 2009. Uh, that's the only space entrepreneur in the world to have started companies in three different continents, which Dr. Rao already mentioned. Uh, Ms. Neelu Khatri, 
as a successful uh, career in IAF, Anilu joined KPMG and then she joined Honeywell as president of aerospace defense and space business. Uh, currently, she is the senior VP uh, at Akasa. Uh, Ms. Janna Tiwana, the youngest of our panelists today, she's already spent four years as management consultant in Bain and Company, London and Tokyo offices. Uh, she would be moving to a new position within the next couple of weeks to join uh, iSpace Incorporated as the European Business Development and Partnership uh, Officer. Uh, today, she's representing uh, the global team at Space Tide. So over to you, Aarti. Uh, let's have the conversation going. Thank you so much, uh, Jitata. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel. Thank you so much for inviting me to do so. And let me just thank Dr. Rao for, I think I speak on behalf of all of the ladies here, for making us feel individually and collectively so special. Thank you very much. Um, I rarely have the privilege of discussing with other Indian ladies from the aerospace sector, and it, it really is a privilege today. I just wanted to start with a couple of introductory remarks. India is taken very seriously on the global sta space stage, and it's no wonder when we look at the talent that it produces. But as a country, it still has quite a way to go in terms of promoting women into leadership positions, no matter how good they are. So each of our panelists does have their own story to tell. And before getting into a discussion with them, I'm going to invite each of them to give us a snapshot of how they got where they are. So Dr. Lalithambika, if I can start with you, please give us your opening remarks. Thank you so much. You know, I, most of my history has already been covered, but I'll just give a brief uh, background. Uh, basically, I was born in Kerala, which is the southernmost state of India, and in 1962. And incidentally, that was the year when INCOSPAR was formed. INCOSPAR is the precursor to today's Indian Space Research Organization. And I'm also sure that I am the only grandmother in this panel. So it's a privilege to be here with all of you uh, young achievers. So I initially did my bachelor's as well as master's in control engineering and i started work in isro more than three decades back as a control system designer at this uh, vikram sarabhai space center which is the mother center of isro and uh, of course responsibilities added on so i took charge of that whole area navigation guidance control design validation simulation testing from the workhorse of ISRO, that is the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle onwards. So the very nature of uh, our work is interdisciplinary and is spread across different geographical locations. And uh, there's a very high level of cohesive teamwork that is required to make it happen, as in any space endeavor, of course. And I have had the opportunity to lead large interdisciplinary teams. And I must also say that my family have been solidly with me all throughout. It was my grandfather who was a dedicated mathematician with a keen interest in a wide range of domains who first kindled my interest in space. And uh, my parents also never said no to anything just because I was a girl. I could continue my studies after marriage and motherhood happened while I was in the middle of my MTech course. So both my parents and husband have been playing a very important role in bringing up my children. Since the nature of our work naturally requires a lot of travel, and of course, working late goes without saying, because we have all those deadlines to be met. And uh, this help was very invaluable. Since this is also meant to be about women in space, I thought I should mention uh, this uh, personal side, uh, because without that, it would have been very difficult to do full justice to the responsibilities that came with the career growth. And uh, currently, I am a grandmother of three, and I'm heading the directorate of Human Space Program, which is headquartered in Bangalore. And uh, I'm responsible for basically for defining the directions of the Indian uh, Human Space Program, which is a new endeavor for uh, India. 
and uh, for bringing together the national expertise to carry out this program. And this first phase of the program is what is currently underway. It is called Gaginyan. Uh, thank you very much. That's all about myself. Thank you so much. You you really are an inspiration to us, and uh, I'm glad to see that India also has its own hidden figures. I'm sure that we're all familiar with that movie. Uh, Susmita, let me invite you to take the floor. Tell us something about India's first space startup, Earth to Orbit, and how you have achieved all of this. Uh, thank you, Arthi. Um, so, women in space uh, was never a novelty for me. I was born in the early 70s, around the same time that ISRO was incorporated as an entity. I, uh, for most part, I was raised in Ahmedabad, um, among the pioneers of the space program, the very, uh, you know, the first recruits that Sarapai hired uh, when ISRO started, my dad being one of them. Um, and even back in the 70s and 80s, ISRO had a significant number of women scientists um, and even in my family, I was always surrounded by independent, educated, talented, opinionated women. Uh, all of my aunts had a master's or a PhD. So I think um, this whole aura that we are putting around women in space uh, is a bit um, is a bit awkward for me because I took it I took it for granted since I was a schoolgirl. Um, in Ahmedabad, not only was I exposed to the fantastic things that ISROs, one of its main centers, Space Application Center, was working on, I was also living in a neighborhood where I could bicycle to some of the finest institutions of the country, School of Architecture, National Institute of Design, uh, Indian Institute of Management, Physical Research Laboratory. I can go on and on. There, there are all of these. I could literally go on and get on my bicycle and access some of the most amazing people and libraries that you could find in the country. So in that sense, I had a very inspiring childhood. Uh, Ahmedabad also happens to be the place where wealthy cotton mill owner families uh, would invite and commission amazing architects, you know, uh, both from India and abroad. So Corbusier, Charles Correa, Louis Kahn, Doshi, uh, so I grew up among architects, children of architects, and even patrons of architecture. So if you put space and architecture together, juxtapose them, what you have is space architecture, which is what I wanted to do, um, you know, as uh, uh, sort of professionally. There was no such um, curriculum or degree that you could pursue to become a space architect or a spaceship designer. So I had to pretty much craft out my own path and I have a very, very uh, multidisciplinary educational background. I have four different degrees. I have an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Then I went on to do a master's in industrial design at the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. Uh, and before, even before I started my university journey, I was already working on um, self-initiated projects where I would come up with design solutions for living and working in microgravity. It had nothing to do with my curriculum as such. Uh, after the National Institute of Design, I went to study at the International Space University in Strasbourg in France, uh, not, not for another master's really, just to become part of this international community of you know, young people who are crazy about space. Uh, I also along the way did a PhD in Sweden um, and uh, my PhD dissertation was how do we improve the fidelity of planetary mission simulators? Um, I started my professional career in 1998 um, at Boeing in Southern California, where I worked for the International Space Station program. Um, what was interesting is uh, it was nearly impossible for a foreign national to be working on a site where they make rockets. So I had two job offers, one from Aerospatial in Paris, near Paris in Lemuro, to work for the space station program. And the other one was from McDonnell Douglas in California. So the French tried really hard to get the, the security clearance to hire me, but that didn't come through. Uh, the Americans, on the other hand, it took them 15 months, but they did manage to get the clearance they needed to have a foreign national work for the space station program in Huntington Beach. Um, so that's sort of my the beginning of my journey. And after three years of working for Boeing, I left Boeing and started my first little company in San Francisco in 2000. I was 29. 
Then I started my second company in Vienna, in Austria, in 2004. It's called Liquifer. We celebrated our 15th anniversary a couple of years ago. I moved back to India in 2008, and I started uh, Earth to Orbit. So that's sort of been my journey so far. And I think the pandemic has been a great time of uh, sort of recalibration and resets. And I'm now thinking of leaving mainstream entrepreneurship. And I recently launched India's first dedicated space think tank this past weekend. Uh, the name of the think tank is Spaceport Sarabhai. And with that, I think I'll hand it over back to you, Aarti. Thanks, Susmita. I can only say, wow, <laughs> it's very impressive what you've achieved. I am curious to see what you will do next. And congratulations on your the launch of your, your new think tank. I hope it does very well. Um, Nilu, the, the temptation to call you Wing Commander Khatri is still there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will try to resist the temptation. You're now Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at Akasa Air, India's newest airline. Give us a snapshot about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Anati. I must say that I have a very, very different background. First of all, I'm not a tech woman, but I still exist in space and aerospace, for so to say. Um, uh, you know, so maybe I come as a hope or, you know, some kind of a ray for uh, people who are not really with engineering background, uh, a very quick snapshot. Uh, I come from a very, very small uh, town called Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh, you know, and, and in those days during the 70s, there were very little that uh, anybody could do, not just women, uh, very little that anybody could do in the, that town. Uh, but somehow, uh, I think I was very lucky that while I was graduating, I saw this, you know, one big advert saying, uh, Indian Air Force plans to hire women uh, for the first time and do you have it in you, you know? Uh, so uh, the question was, uh, with my parents was, uh, do I get married to the boy he, they had chosen for me? Or, you know, they said, okay, we'll give you a chance to go and give this exam. They knew I would fail. I was like 47 kgs in weight and the typical mindset was, the moment you were applying for a FOGI, you had to be a tall, dark, handsome. I mean, that uh, women getting into defense was not even known that time. So they said, OK, you know, go ahead and uh, apply for it. Once you fail, you come and give, you know, get married to this guy. And I think to their horror, I got selected. And uh, I, <laughs> I was so fast to move out of the town. You know, the media guys were standing outside my house, interviewing my mother. Uh, how do you feel being, you know, the, the uh, mother of uh, a lady who's made it to the Air Force, the first one from the state, blah, blah. And I just kind of, you know, took advantage of that glory and escaped, you know, I would say, uh, the societal pressure, so to say. Although my parents were never hugely no for anything, but, but you know, there were always those uh, constraints that society puts in. And I think I was very, very lucky to have escaped that. So I, I took one year of training at Hyderabad, uh, Dundigal, and uh, went on to become a procurement specialist in, uh, in the Indian Air Force as a logistics officer. Uh, so my job was to keep all the air, aircraft fly, inventory control, warehousing, etc. And, and that, that, you know, it was always behind the, the, my, my mind on, you know, oh my God, I'm supporting this, but I'm never a part of the mainstream. Uh, uh, and, and that kind of put me on tenter hooks. So I was always trying to better myself because I wanted to be part of this industry. Um, and when I left Air Force in 2008 as a premature, because those days there were no permanent commission uh, to the uh, women officers, it came few few years later. And um, I was given an option to, to kind of rejoin. You know, I thought I was looking at, at KPMG and management consulting with space and aerospace companies like Boeing and Lockheed. And it was too interesting for me to leave and go back. Um, at KPMG, you know, was an absolutely brilliant platform for me, wherein I learned the business side of it on, you know, the, the, uh, the policy matters, how to set up businesses, how to collaborate with the Western companies. And that is where, you know, my couple of my initial interactions with Boeing and some few uh, projects with Boeing space really got me onto this industry. 
post KPMG, I was hired as the head of strategy for Honeywell in India, which is again a very, very great uh, space and aerospace company uh, with a huge amount of inertia navigation systems across the world as suppliers, as, of, as number one uh, you know, product suppliers. Uh, I headed that business for about four and a half years and a uh, and few years later, you know, a couple of years back, I set up my own consulting firm wherein I manage few uh, French, German, Swedish space companies, uh, set up their uh, Indian collaboration with Indian companies. I help them, you know, understand the market, understand, make business cases for them and, and uh uh, very, very recently, uh, that's a second uh, assignment that I have. Uh, you might have heard, for those of you who've heard, who've heard Akasa Air is the new uh, low-cost airlines to be launched in India. And I also, in parallel, uh, am the senior vice uh, president as a government relationship for launching of these airlines. Thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you, Nilu. Great, great story. I empathize with a lot of what you said. I'm also non-technical, so you're not alone. There's two of us. Um, but let's come to Jenna. Jenna, you seem so young, yet you have traveled so much already from London to Tokyo and now Luxembourg uh, awaits you. The next part of what I'm sure is going to be a very successful journey. Tell us something about yourself. Yes. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for having me on this panel. It's just phenomenal. Um, so my, my my dad is um, from the Punjab. My mom is from the Gujarat, but I was born here in the UK. Um, so, um, my background is aerospace engineering, uh, um, and I have a second master's from the International Space University. Is heard earlier um, um but i'm I, i'm happy to talk to what's happened so far um i i I'm a, spent four years as a management consultant as we said um learning up the the business skills to accompany my technical background and soon i'll be joining ispace inc in their business development team uh, in luxembourg um, in my spare time outside of my day job, I also help other space nonprofits from around the world. So Space Tide, uh, based in Tokyo. I'm a member of the Eagle Action Team uh, for the Space Generation Advisory Council, putting together their perspective on lunar governance. Um, and we presented that to the UN earlier this year. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Next Generation Network for the British Interplanetary Society. Um, I'll leave it there because I, I know we have a lot to get to, um, but I, I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Thank you, Jenna. That's great. So we've heard from all of our panelists and I hope that everybody is inspired already. I know that I certainly am. Now let's dive into a discussion. Um, uh, Dr. Lali Thambika, I want to come back to you. Uh, we know you've held senior roles within ISRO, first dealing with launch vehicles, now the human space program. ISRO is meanwhile a 50-year-old Indian institution. Uh, I could be wrong, but I suppose it is still a place where if I was there, I would probably mostly bump into men. So I would like to understand, as a woman, how have the challenges evolved since you started working there until today? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, you are right. When I joined, there were just a handful of women engineers around. Uh, of course, as the years went by, more and more of us joined. So what happened in the beginning was we have our space port at Sriharikota. And since I was into the design and uh, checking all the integration uh, and all, I used to make trips to Sriharikota. In the beginning, it was very uh, strange in the sense that when we go to the launch pad area, uh, even there would be most of the infrastructure would be tuned uh, for men, including the washrooms and uh, would not have been, that was in the very beginning. But uh, very soon, a large number of women started occupying various positions across ISRO. And uh, then uh, this aspect became much easier for all of us. And uh, currently, there are very many young women and uh, middle level women. So, 
i'm sure that uh, as the years go by we will be seeing several uh, women more and more women holding responsible positions we have around 20% of uh, women in isro thank you thanks okay so smita let me bring you in you you make it look easy when we listen to your introduction you really made it look easy but the reality is it isn't that easy for many people and in india there is so much pressure on young people to excel in science and maths and there's lots of competition for them as well how can students differentiate themselves to excel like you have done you're on mute susmita yeah sorry about that um so arti uh, i'll respond to your question in a second but i'd like to add that dr lalita mika um the position that she is in today uh and she just mentioned that isro has 20% of its cadre is women um in the last 20 years of my aerospace career i've seen that isro and nasa had the best gender ratios in the world when i started in 98 in europe european space agencies there were very few women the number has grown steadily so i don't see why isro after 50 years um despite having women like dr lalita ambika and others who have headed rocket programs satellite programs has not had a single woman head any of the major isro centers and still better why haven't we had a woman be the chairperson of isro Uh, I'll come. I'll come to your question now. Yes, I did make it sound very easy, uh, simply because I think the way I pursued space, I stayed out of the rat race entirely. I did not go for any of the big entrance exams, uh, the IITs. I was not after the GRE. I was not exactly looking looking to go to the United States per se. I was pursuing a passion. and in my particular case there was no direct path to becoming someone who would go on to design space habitats and rovers and suit boats and you know that kind of stuff so i had to invent my path as i went along now coming back to your second part of your question how can young people uh, who are interested in in space or any other science discipline for that matter um differentiate themselves and excel in what they do I think I would recommend three things. One is stay clear of the rat race. Uh two is step back um and think. You know there's so much pressure on kids these days from the parents from the the educational system per se that they are often forced to make choices. Um you know just imagine a 17 year old and 18 year old um sometimes i encourage children who i am very close to you know as a guardian or as a mentor that it's okay to take a year off and even think what is it that you want to do um go work for a year for someone go intern somewhere for a year and once you figured out your path um even if it is difficult be fearless um be in it for the long haul because you know space unlike it for example uh we have to design things we have to build things we have to make them flight ready so it takes a good 5 to 6 years for a mission uh so you have to have the tenacity the grit the resilience to be there and not give up and i think excellence i mean it's just a natural outcome if you're able to do all of these things so that's my message arti Thanks Smita. I couldn't agree with you more and I want to pick up on the point that you raised about Israel and actually draw a parallel with Europe. Um there is no pressure at all within our industry to put women into leadership positions. There is not there's no pressure on it. Certainly not in Europe. I see that um I wish it was different. We do talk about this behind the scenes. uh but um i i actually i was listening to an interview of christine lagarde uh, speaking at my old mba school last week and she was asked about quotas are they necessary and every woman would like to say no we we should be promoted on our merits but she said no no they are necessary uh there is no carrot here it's not sweet enough we need a stick um but okay that would be a, a different debate uh, maybe we can come back to that in a second um let me go on to nilu nilu uh, as we said you and me, you and i we both neither of us have technical backgrounds 
Yet you have managed to rise to senior positions in high tech organizations and companies. Did you always want to work in a high tech field? Or is this something that just happened to you? I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all, because in my case, it really happened to me. And I, I was not like Susmita said, take time and figure out what you want to do. I could not do that. I only figured out what I was meant to do when I was 30 years old, um, already 20 years ago, but still that's pretty late uh, when you think about your, your life path. But anyway, anyway, this is about you. Is it something that happened to you? Did you plan it? So I loved what Sushmita said, you know, and I loved the way her mind works in such a logical fashion. Uh, so I, I would say I was not like Sushmita when I was growing up, especially. Uh, uh, in my times, probably the environment that I came out was, was very, very harsh. I did not have the... Uh, you know, a very educated set of parents who were very driven to, you know, towards their children education. I did not have any of that. I we did not come from a very, um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, family that could afford uh, tuitions and extra hours from teachers, etc. We did not have that. Uh, and uh, it was very unfortunate that when I was studying, I was from that archaic school system, which actually made children decide subjects when you were in class eight, not even 10. Uh, and, and that resulted in, you know, uh, me and, and those days we did not have commerce as well. So it was either you chose humanities or you chose physics, chemistry or bio, you know, so doctor, engineer, yeah, homemaker, that was the only three subjects we had. And uh, just because, you know, I was not uh, performing well, I was put into a slot which was into humanities and my heart did not lie there. I did, I did not even find myself capable there. I remember going to my friends' mothers to get them to make my silai karai or whatever cooking assignments because I, I did not have that in me. So uh, initial years were quite a, uh, distressing ones, I must say, wherein I could not find my place. Uh, but I think the one thing that was very, very strong with me, when even when I was a 14 or a 15 year old kid was that I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to settle for anything that I don't want to be in, into. So, so I, again, as I said, you know, don't know what to do, but I knew what not to do. So I kept on going with that. And uh, it was you know, I, I did have uh, reading as my passion. So English literature was something that I enjoyed. So for the time being, I really enjoyed doing my master's into English literature. And it was sheer luck, I would say, that I got into uh, the aerospace, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, Indian Air Force that brought me into the mainstream aerospace segment. Uh, and I, as I think is that, you know, somewhere down the line, I, I am a believer of destiny and aspirations. Uh, going back to what Sushmita was saying, you know, that uh, you don't need to put yourself into so much of pressure. You don't need to figure out any answer with any timeline. Every human being has a journey. Some people will accomplish at 21, lose at 40. Some will start at 40, continue till certain time. There is absolutely no ready-made formula in life. You know, I'm sure Miss Madam Lalitambika also would not have uh, imagined that she would be sitting in this chair when she was a young schoolgirl, you know, or a college graduate. So uh, my advice is very, very sim simple. You know, follow what you wish to do. Let it take whatever time. Uh, these days, you know, with so much of uh, the country flourishing, the families are not so bad uh, at least you know you don't have that shock or uh, 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 mindset of uh, you know putting yourself into a, a, a dal roti makan kind of a mindset right you we are more privileged i must say i have two boys you know who are in, uh, in their early 20s and uh, uh, i always tell them you guys are more privileged than what the other generation was you have time to think you, you do have some uh, mindset to sit, sit down and think about it and, and then follow it. In my case, once I was in the Air Force, I think it gave me a very beautiful 
confidence level coming up in my way and you know at a national level i used to be handling the 26th january parade every year uh, and and you know really uh, 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 and if you do those kind of things once at a national level your name comes in every year you know so um, uh, the 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 one part that i did in my life was that whatever i did i did it with utmost sincerity and hard work it doesn't matter what i did and i think that kept on giving you know there is nothing like good luck good luck also comes with a lot of hard work and once you are hard working a lot of good luck opportunities come your way so getting into the next level of kpmg and you know getting uh, into honeywell i remember i mean i was the first uh, business leader handling 800 crore of business in honeywell and i was not an engineer you know but i had a set of engineers with me i had about you know 5000 engineers in honeywell in india i could i could pick up their brains and 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 they, uh, and use it so there's there's nothing that stops you from doing anything that you want to do just be sincere and work hard towards it thank you neelu i can't believe how each speaker is is you know more inspiring than the last one and we keep going around so this is this is great uh, food for all the students who are watching um i agree with you look i didn't know what i wanted to do i did know what i did not want to do but i also knew that i was not going to be told what to do so i made it pretty hard for on myself because i really took a long long time to figure out what i was meant to do but once you figure that out um then the world is your oyster so jenna we're going to come to you you are the closest one to um uh, having you know to to having been a student that from all of us how did you discover the right career path for you after deciding on space how did you learn about the different roles that were available etc yeah it's a it's a great question and actually um it's not as linear as i think everyone thinks everyone thinks you kind of pick a career path and 30 years later you end up being it and actually for me i always had a passion for space i always knew that i wanted to expand the you know expand my knowledge of it and progress the industry and and i signed up to an engineering degree and um with it maybe it wasn't for me um and you know maybe i want something a little bit different which of course led me to a place where i didn't know where to turn to and that was really difficult having known for so long what i wanted to do all of a sudden not knowing what you want to do is actually very scary um my advice i guess and how i dug myself out of that um is i found a mentor um mentors are super super powerful super helpful to have um someone in the industry that's more senior than you or that you can just go and talk to very openly and be a sounding board for you so um that's one thing that helped me i kind of went crying to my supervisor of my thesis at the time and he sat me down had a very long conversation with me about what my next step could be um and that that cleared up the fog a little bit so that's the first thing um is when you're finding you're trying to find your path um find a mentor because they can connect you with someone they can help advise you they've been there most likely um the second part of that is also just do do your own research a little bit um one thing that i found that really kind of clicked for me was i found someone whose job basically i wanted later on down the line and then i reverse engineered my way there and i was like this is what i want to do this is the title that i want how can i get there what skills do i need to bridge um and there everything then feels a little bit more achievable right because you know where you're trying to get to you know what what you need to do to get there and getting there might not be you know i need to do another degree or i might need to do a phd i mean it might be but it also might be things like i need to volunteer at my local you know space enthusiast club or i need to organize an event and actually it's it might not be even the the hard skills if you like that you need to bridge it might just be things like organization or networking which everyone finds awkward everyone finds awkward um but you kind of got to you kind of got to get over that and put yourself out there um so for me finding my role was really thanks to a lot of other people um a lot of talking um and and leaning upon the seniors of the industry um that would be willing to speak and actually it's surprising how willing in our space community people want to help others that's one of the best things about the space community everyone is so open to helping others 
Um, so it, it's it's a matter of taking upon yourself, um, putting yourself out there, exploring what's out there, um, but also leveraging leveraging what's the trodden paths already, and and find someone that you find inspiring, and reach out to them on LinkedIn. We have all these amazing platforms now. You gotta you gotta just go for it. You gotta just go for it, and it's hard, and it feels awkward, but it's so worth it. It's so so worth it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Dr. Lalita Ambekam, coming back to you. If you look back, would you have done anything differently if you could turn back time? Uh, that is also a very, very thought provoking question. And uh, I, before that, I must say that I really loved what uh, Neelu was saying. I found it so true in my life as well. Uh, so I think I'll take a little bit of time to answer this particular question. As I mentioned earlier, I was initially a designer for a long time. I was taking up a responsibility for more and more systems. But basically, the nature of work was always the same. I did not feel the need to move out to a totally different domain. Then I stepped out of my comfort zone and took on a diametrically opposite role, which involved independent real-time testing of all the designs. Then later on, I took on both these roles together and continued with that. Around four years back, at the age of uh, more than 55, I took on a totally different role where we were defining a new program, going beyond our organization, identifying the national players, getting them on board, everything. So each time I stepped out of my comfort zone, I had a spurt of personal growth. Now, other, otherwise, it was like a continuum. This is like a disruption and suddenly there was a burst of growth. So... And uh, more knowledge and uh, more skills, both interpersonal and management skills, everything. So I felt that uh, for quite some time in each role, I was established in my comfort zone. I was content to go with the flow. And I wish I had done this uh, stepping out of my comfort zone more often and had actively sought and moved to many more new domains. So I don't have any regrets at all. I have been amply recognized for my work. But uh, if I had the time all over again, I would definitely have done this stepping out much more frequently than uh, I have done. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. You're really echoing what Jenna said, which is, you know, go for it, take the plunge, even if it's uncomfortable, do it anyway. So um, Jenna, you must be very wise already. So, Susmita, coming back to you, uh, you by establishing a company or three companies and now a think tank, you have really broken out of a mold which is often created for women, which is not to study too much and not to become too independent. Um, was that difficult? Did your family support you? Okay. Well, um, honestly, uh, Arthi, I did not encounter any such mold personally. Quite the contrary, actually. Uh, I had a very, very gender neutral upbringing. Um, I had all the freedom to do what I want, study what I want, go where I like. So I, I don't think I was constrained as such ever, ever. Quite the contrary by my family. Uh, but having said that, after working in Boeing for three years, I think I'll, I'll have to add a little thing, a little important note here. So though I was trained in design and engineering, I, when I joined Boeing, because I was a foreign national, they could not give me access to the in intranet. So I could not work on design stuff. Instead, they, th they thought, okay, why not have her do international business development? So that was an inflection point in my career, if you ask me. Because by being in international business development, while the rest of the space station program was making money for the company, oh, sorry, spending money for the space station program, we were a bunch of 12 people making money for the program, exactly the opposite. So we had to go out and sell anything from an entire module to, let's say, a small space qualified fire extinguisher. So that experience in Boeing was amazing for me because I got to understand the business side of things, you know, bid and proposal, negotiating, managing international contracts. So I got to uh, got a sense of the nature of the beast, you know, the aerospace industry. And that has been very useful in being an entrepreneur. The reason I chose to become an entrepreneur at age 29, um, I thought, OK, I've been in Boeing for three years. I've learned everything I could. It's getting repetitive. So let's go out and do something of my own. 
my super boss in Boeing was the one who said, who sat me down and said, Susmita, think about it. Are you sure you want to leave a job and go start a company? You know, back then, nobody was going out and starting space companies. The word startup didn't even exist. Uh, he had tried being an entrepreneur, my boss, and he had come right back. Uh, if I were to quote him, he said, Susmita, starting your own company is not like having triplets, but like having quintuplets. And I'm quoting him verbatim. Uh, I told him, look, you know, you can't scare me. You know, I, I'm going to go out, start my little company, whatever it takes. The reason, there are two reasons. One is I like to speak my mind. And when you work for a large company or a large government space agency, you can't speak as freely. You have to toe the official line, more or less. And second, if you want to challenge the status quo or change the status quo, you have to be an independent agent. And I think being an entrepreneur gives you that advantage. Of course, it is very, very hard to be an entrepreneur, uh, especially a space entrepreneur where, you know, like I said, it involves hardware, it, inv it involves flight ready stuff. Um, so I think having this combination of business skills uh, or a business understanding of aerospace is very important if you want to go out and start your own company. And uh, of course, it's not going to be easy. There'll be huge regulatory hurdles everywhere. Uh, everything is dual purpose technology. So you will have to deal with export control. Um, and which is why I always tell young people, go work in a, in a company first or in a space agency first. Understand how it works and then go out and take do, do what you want, you know, create a company you like. So that's that's sort of my lead into the thing. And, and before I sign off on this question, I wanted to add that I'm really proud of uh, Neelu and her ilk who got into the Indian Air Force as women. Today, India has 12% of its pilots are women. It's the highest in the world. I think the United States, 4% of their pilots are women. So I was very, very disappointed when ISRO in its first phase of astronaut selection did not allow women to apply. And I think with that, I hand it back, back to you, uh, Arthi. Thanks, Susmita. Again, great points uh, made there. Let's stick with the same theme, Nilu. I want to bring you back in. Uh, you are definitely a role model. All of the women panelists here are. But uh, you, as a non-technical person who's made it in this industry, um, you know, what advice would you give to young women who do look at you and see you as a role model, but who don't necessarily have the backing and the support of their families, be it for cultural reasons, uh, you know, tradition and so on, maybe for financial reasons. Sure. And and that's a very good point, Arti. So, uh, you know, I have been, uh, you know, as a leader of some large uh, global companies, I inevitably got into uh, mentoring women specifically with an aim of helping them break the ceiling, so to say. These are all new jargons that have come into the new world, but these are some of the hard facts as well. Uh, so it could be breaking into managerial jobs, it could be breaking into a career, it could be breaking into management positions, you know, uh, all of that. But, but literally the answer remains the same for all of that. I think a lot of it uh, will come from the fact on how you think of your life, you know, as, as a person, as a woman in this case. Um, I think having a lot of clarity of mind and confidence always helps. Uh, just giving, you know, uh, an impression to your family, oh, this person knows what he or she wants. It really helps. Uh, because if you don't, then comes all different types of, you know, Sushmita said that. Uh, she said, I went to my boss and my boss said, oh, don't do this. But once you're clear in your mind, no, this is what I want to do. And then people just fall back. And ultimately, your families do understand. They might be things, I mean, not that I came from a family that was always go from the right from the beginning. Uh, uh, so one is, you know, have that confidence in yourself. Bring a little clarity on thought. And that comes in once you think it over, when you're reading enough, you, you know, you have your mentors, you have your counsels, etc., who are telling you. So all of that needs to come from within. And once you have that, you automatically earn trust from families or people who are so-called the naysayers, right? That's the one point. The second point, which I must make specifically for, uh, you know, women who are in the mid-20s, uh, 
getting married or got married and have children, etc., and mother-in-laws, etc., etc. I mean, I've seen uh, people who have left senior management positions because their husbands they would have superseded their husbands if they if they did that. You know, how do you handle those kind of situations? I mean, these are real life situations that women live into. It, be it any industry, not just space and aerospace. Be it any industry. So I think the one thing that I always say is that you know you need to bring your uh, uh, your your world into your vision. You know, talk about your vision and passion with the people who matter the most to you, so that they equally live your vision and passion, just like how you eat, drink, breathe your dreams. And that helps. Believe me, that helps. You know, my mother, I know how I converted her and my mother-in-law, how I converted them, that they start believing into any project that I do and they, whatever little they know about it, but they start talking about it to the whole world. Oh, she's doing this, you know, half things would be wrong, but the passion is the same that I breathe and live. That's the second thing. And the third thing, which is the most important for women who are working, um, you know, I'm sure all all you you know audience people today may not be married and working, but in some days you will be. In some years you will be. Uh, you know, get your environment to help you. Uh, for example, uh, invest in yourself. So let's say you have a salary of a hundred dollar, right? We women in whatever field we work in. We have a tendency of putting ourselves at the last. Even if you are spend, you know, earning yourself and you're the only person you have to take care of, you don't do that, right? So invest in yourself, invest in the dhobi wala, invest in the cook, invest in the driver, invest in anybody who makes your life easy because these are the people who will make you rise up. And, you know, along with you, you are actually picking up a strata of society and growing with you. I mean, I have my cook, my driver, my maid for the last 15 years, and I ensure that everybody else is growing along with me. It's not just my growth. It's an ecosystem growth. I think that's the kind of input I have for uh, youngsters today. Neela, that's fantastic. Um, for me, uh, motivation I, uh, in my job, I couldn't do it if I wasn't changing something, if I wasn't making a difference to people's lives. And it's indeed not just about the work. You, you really want to just help and make a difference to people's lives where everybody who's around you uh, change the ecosystem. And by changing ourselves, we change, we change the world. We know it. All right. Thank you for that. We're in our last, uh, last seven minutes of the event. Jenna, let me come back to you for a second. We were just talking about cultures and how the culture you come from can really influence uh, the opportunities you have and so on. Now, you, have, you went from London to Tokyo, but you're an Indian. How did you become accustomed to working in, in a culture that you were not familiar with? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. And um, I think it's two things. So one is um, really asking questions and being curious. Having that curiosity is so powerful because we live in the most beautifully diverse world. Um, so having that innate curiosity where you don't mind asking questions, you don't mind, you know, maybe feeling like you don't know it all and, and you know, and you're back to observe that's the first thing right like moving to a new country you're not going to know everything you're probably going to offend someone you might have your up days you might have but accepting that and and ever learning is so important um the second thing is really finding the balance between your gut instinct what you think is right how you would tackle things um whilst being surrounded and shrouded by the culture that you're in right so when you're moving abroad no one is telling you to change, no one is telling you to change how you think, where you come from, what your background is. It's so important to remember your roots. So keep hold of your roots, never forget that. Um, but also make sure that you are adaptable and flexible and never be afraid to ask. That's the first thing, right? People, people know that you're new. Um, it's a matter of being flexible. And me, for example, moving to Tokyo, uh, learning to you know, how I should bow or the right situations to, to address people or how to address people. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I just went there and sat down with a friend and asked them over a coffee because otherwise you do risk never not fitting in as a, and achieving your potential as much as you can in that country, right? So it's about finding that balance of learning, um, but also staying true to who you are. You're, no one's asking you to be anything other than who you 
you are and that's what you are. so so keep 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 your true to yourself um and be open to learn really and never be afraid to ask is my experience thank you jenna thanks for sharing that we in our last five minutes i just want to give an example from my own experience and get your reactions to that um I interview candidates periodically for my MBA school. And last year I interviewed um, an Indian uh, gentleman, he, he, a young person, he must have been 26, 27 years old. He was the product of India's best engineering schools, had a first class CV. I, I totally understand how he was selected for interview, but I rejected him outright. He showed me no emotional intelligence, no personality. He even thought that I was joking when I asked him if he thought that soft skills were important in business. So now when we consider India in a geopolitical context, we fully understand why the focus on maths and on science in education is so important. But the world is coming to realize the impact of gender diversity, soft skills on the bottom line. Does India need to change its approach or is it still the right approach? Will the emphasis on maths and science always be the ticket to success? Is enough attention given to the cultivation of soft skills or are they just looked down on? Um, who wants to go first? Open to whoever would like to respond. Susmita, come on. Yeah, I, I, th I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think this whole idea of soft skills is probably not even discussed within, you know, those who are designing curriculums or starting new universities. But having said that, it is starting to change art. If you look at some of the newer institutions like Ashoka or Jindal, um, those are designed differently. And I think they do take into account soft skills. So I think you're right. But I think things are starting to change for the better. Excellent. Nilu, you wanted to come in. You're Maybe I'll give you a funny anecdote, you know. So, uh, again, I had entered into a world of men in defense. And just to let you know, you know, uh, in defense, men thought that unless you were, you know, really using the choicest adjectives with the other ranked men, the soldiers, you were never successful. You know, that was the typical culture. And when women walked in, they, the, 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 the worst pain point that men officers or fellow officers had was that they were not able to abuse, so to say, uh, you know, in front of them. And uh, uh, there were harsh times, uh, specifically in the field areas. I was in the dark. I was managing uh, uh, the 26th January parade where you had to work for 23 hours or 22 hours at night to put the trailers, etc. Same with Ladakh as well. Uh, I think uh, it really uh, evolved me as a leader and for any important jobs. I mean, I remember when I was getting uh, a farewell from one of my units, my, one of my CO said she, that she was the only man officer in the unit, which actually meant, I mean, that was a crude way of putting it. But what he meant was that she could actually get things done from the soldiers when, where other male officers could not. And the reason I was able to do that was a very high level of empathy. You know, I could understand why soldiers were not able to perform. Maybe they had family issues. Maybe the child was sick. And I had that decency to go up to that guy and ask him what's wrong. You know, why you are not? And, you know, because most of the uh, projects that we were doing or work or assignments that were, we were doing were always out of. Uh, office hours, you know, with such little salary, it was basically motivational work. I mean, a soldier becomes a soldier because uh, because of motivation, not for financial reasons. And and that that can only be addressed with a kind of a uh, emotional understanding of the situation and make him more motivated. I think I could just do that. One very small, uh, you know, I know I'll take another thirty seconds, but ex experience I will share. Uh, uh, I was a young officer walking into the, uh, you know, in uniform and you are more proud and, uh, you know, uh, confident than what you should be. Uh, and, and I had this uh, six, 6.2 feet uh, jack male coming in who was a soldier and he did not salute me. And that kind of got me so angry that he's disrespected me, blah, blah, blah. He salutes male officers. He doesn't salute women officers. And I put him on charge, you know, which is a very serious thing to do, because if you don't salute a senior officer, you can be going to court martial. And I thought I would use my right to do that. 
and um, all that happened uh, a couple of days later his officer called me and he said neelu you must at least come and listen to why, why this happened you know he's really not that he did not mean any disrespect and when i actually went he said madam that was the first time i actually saw a woman officer i was so taken aback that i could forgot to salute that you were an officer so so we all came from different backgrounds and different mindsets i think uh, it's really really important to have a very strong emotional and uh, uh, connect with your team and that lesson i learned which i carried on into the corporate world as well that was such a sweet anecdote i'm i'm so glad that he was taken aback in awe and that he wasn't being rude or or offensive okay we i think we're we've already gone slightly over time it has been a wonderful discussion um thank you so much to all of you for having participated uh, chitrata thank you for giving us this opportunity dr rao again my my extreme gratitude to you for for making us feel really really special and and honored uh with that i close the session and hand back over to chitrata i think you on mute chitrata uh no i'm muted can you hear me now can you hear me yes okay uh so thank you thank you thank you all of you for such a fabulous session i really don't have uh, there really isn't any space for an ending note or something all i can say is uh, to all those listening to the students to the uh, uh, young youngsters who are looking to start their businesses follow your hearts and grab your portion of the sky so thank you thanks thanks to them thanks to all of you and thank you dr rao thank you so much thank you so much thank you bye 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 thank you thank you